One minute. Okay, let's keep going here and make sure we stay up to speed. You have to stop talking now so I can talk. All right, be quiet. Uh, I haven't posted the sort of uh, secondary video yet because I figured out I had a big weekend retreat I had to go to that tied up the entire weekend. So running tight on time, but I, uh, one of the trouble, one of the problems with doing the, those kind of videos is that it takes, if you're not set up, half an hour to 45 minutes to do set up, half an hour to tear down. That's twice as long as the video itself takes. So I figured since I may have to do this a number of times this semester, that I'll convert my office to a convertible studio so I can get set up in less than 10 minutes and tear down in five minutes. So I actually did that on Thursday and Friday. I had an old Windows 7 machine that I was going to convert to a Linux machine sitting there. So instead, I tore it down and threw it away and created the space and set it up as a studio. So now I'm ready to actually do not one, but maybe two or three of those. And probably the next uh, lecture segment will be that kind of video because it's drier, less interesting material when I tend to do those. And so this lecture may be posted and then followed by a video lecture that's recorded only in my office and not here, which will enable us to bring up to speed. But regardless of when I do that or anything else, like the homework assignment, the only matter of authority on anything being available is the course calendar and the lecture page, right? The website, not what I say here because I don't remember how I have set things up that the course calendar is designed. So if the homework is due on such and such a weekend, according to the course calendar, that's what it's due, all right? So rely upon that as your source. So if you check that site a couple of days from now, there may be a newly posted video that I want you to, if so, uh, watch after hearing this one. Or if you're actually watching this uh, later, online than after watching this one. Now we need to keep moving in order to make sure we get through our material on time. So we just finished talking about IPOs. And uh, remember I said that WeWork uh, has uh, substantial governance problems that's interfering with their IPO that may make their IPO unsuccessful. And I told you that they were thinking about all kinds of changes to address that, such as actually changing their corporate governance, which is what they need to do. That is to say, change management is what that actually means in this context. But they decided to simply change their name. <laughs> so they are now called WE. And so the IPO will be WE instead of WeWork. And I guess they hope that that will be sufficient to <laughs> make the necessary changes for them to do a successful IPO because it sounds like they're going to try to do it this week. And so we'll find out if they do. We'll come back and talk about some of the more recent IPOs because I'm making a little collection of how they've all done in the last six months to show you that it has not been a good picture since uh, Lyft and Uber, that every single one of them that I have been able to track has actually fallen from its opening day. So we doesn't have much to look forward to. But let's Come back to IPOs later. Let's continue on with the subject matter here. We need to get around to this discussion of limit orders and how to read, to read bid and ask queues level one and level two. That's critically important information and is heavily represented on the examination. So all the material today has a very heavy weight on the examination. So we stopped here, and uh, as it explains in the book, you can buy stocks in overseas corporations also. The emphasis in this class is on the United States stock market and U.S. listings. But you can buy Sony 
and uh, Mitsubishi, and you can short uh, SoftBank. <laughs> One of you emailed me and said, well, how can we, how can we profit from this uh, WeWork IPO fiasco? And I said, well, you can't really, because you can't short it on the IPO, and there are no options, so you can't trade those. So, I don't know, maybe consider shorting SoftBank, because they might be impacted by it. SoftBank is traded on the Tokyo Exchange, and so it's not easy to short a stock on the Tokyo Exchange. But as I say here on this slide, SoftBank is also traded on the over-the-counter market in the United States. So you can look that up on Yahoo Finance, yeah, Yahoo, Yahoo Finance and uh, see it for yourself. And I, I don't think you can short it, though. That's the trouble. It's hard to short things on the over-the-counter market. But at any rate, if this were normal and you wanted to buy something like Sony, then this existence of American depository receipts, or ADRs as they're commonly called, allows you to do that just as easily as you can buy a, a stock in a U.S. listed company. And the way they do this is to deposit a very large block of shares, as is described here, which is an excerpt from the book, and therefore also described in the book. As to hold a sort of inventory, and then arm, and then they simply price the those shares in the U.S. market in dollar terms, uh, based upon more or less what the Tokyo equivalent would be selling for, given the yen conversion rate at the moment. And so, because of course, what matters is here you're buying this in dollars, and in Tokyo it's trading in yen. So there are two variables that have to reflect the change in the price of Sony, Sony stock. One of those is the change in the actual yen price of Sony stock on the Tokyo exchange, but equally important is the ex uh, changing exchange rate of the yen to the dollar. Now, you, you might say, well, is there some giant computer somewhere that massively and instantly calculates that conversion? Because, of course, the yen dollar exchange rate is in constant flux, even more so than the cost of Sony itself. And the answer is no. These markets rely upon arbitrage to make that change, which means large institutional high-speed traders simply monitor the exchange rate, monitor the price of the stock, and if it appears that the dollar-quoted price of the stock in the United States is out of alignment with the Tokyo quote given the exchange rate, they'll go long or short in that stock to make a small profit and then their action in the market on the demand or supply side will pull those prices into alignment automatically. So many of these, and this may be the first example I've given you of market arbitrage and how arbitrage actually keeps these markets efficient. They're not regulated into efficiency. They're kept efficient by traders. And so, although I just described that, you may not quite see in your mind exactly how it would work. Later on, we will look at some examples where I go through them numerically, and you'll see there at least how they work. I think in the book I also have an example of how it works here in the example of the ADR. Or at least I point out that any given second, this is the price of Sony in Tokyo in yen, and this is the dollar exchange rate, multiply one times the other, this should be there for the dollar price for their ADR, and it is, within a penny or two, of course. And arbitrage, as I say, moving in when it's out of alignment to take advantage of the immediate profit opportunity actually uh, presents, therefore, a supply or demand situation that then, because of that action, pulls it into alignment. Or the action continues until such time as it is pulled into alignment. And it's extremely efficient and very fast and works far better than any supercomputer could do. So, yeah, you could buy Sony, and this is a recent quote there, 59.20 per share. And in the book, I give the example of on whatever day this was taken, uh, or the example of the book was taken, what it was in yen at that moment on that day in Tokyo. So this works very well. In recent years, there's a secondary force that has emerged that's kind of strange, in my opinion. Uh, some of these stocks are also listed in the quirky pink sheet over the counter market, which I criticize in the book as being a market that is unreliable because the diligent standards for the corporations that are listed are not very high. They don't have to meet high standards of reporting or compliance if you're listed on the over the counter market. 
But nonetheless, they are, have set aside a segment of that market that I identify in the chapter that is designed for foreign corporations to list in dollars directly on the over-the-counter market without going through the ADR process. I'm not sure that it works well or not. I'm not sure that if you tried to trade soft bank or short soft bank um, on that market, which is how you would do it, that it would work very well. I'm not sure the price is actually a good price, for example, for that, because it's relatively new. These companies being listed on the over-the-counter market as kind of a freewheeling, let's just list it since it's not against the law and let's hope it works out. Uh, I'm not sure how it's actually working out. I know that the volume tends to be very low, so it is not a popular route yet for people trying to buy overseas stocks. But SoftBank, on the other hand, does not have an ADR listing. And so, and uh, although you can trade uh, Tokyo stocks, as I point out, on interactive brokers or some of the brokerage accounts, if you simply have permission to do that, uh, but a lot of people don't have permission to do that or have not asked for it. So, um, you know, it's there as a possibility, uh, but who knows how efficient that is. But what I expect you to understand is how these ADRs work. This allows us to talk some about stock splits and reverse splits. I already brought up to you that uh, Apple has split a number of times, and the splits have not been two for one, but numbers like seven for one. And this will happen if the board of directors of the corporation in question choose, typically with shareholder approval at an annual meeting, sometimes they control the shares, so this is a perfunctory exercise, to uh, split a stock two for one, three for one, five for one or so, or some other proportion to reduce the price back to a range that may be more attractive to investors. Now I give the conspicuous example of the one company that has refused to short their stock, that being Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's first large company, and so you saw what the share price for that is, and therefore that means you can't buy it very easily. But typically, these companies may like to see their stocks trading in the $50 to $200 range. So when they get up to five or $600 a share or so, they may decide to split it to pull it back down to a more common range. Of course, the amount of shares that you own are adjusted proportionately. So if there's a seven for one stock split, then you uh, owe um, uh, seven times as many shares as you did the day before that you open your brokerage account and there it is if you had 100 shares and on a thursday and you look at your brokerage account and it's now um 700 shares and you'll say wow look at that that's pretty cool but you'll notice the price is more or less one seventh as much as i said in the book there's uh, statistical studies have shown that there's not an apparent gain from doing this that is to say if you invest in a stock simply because they're going to split there's no reason to believe that stock would perform better than if they were not going to split. Well, one study that I cite pointed out maybe a very slight gain, but that could be spurious correlation because companies that are doing stock splits tend to be fairly healthy companies anyway. And so uh, the real interesting story, though, is what is referred to as the reverse stock split, and that's when you're going the other way. That's a one for 20, or one for 10, or one for 50, or one for 20,000 share stock split, all of which I have examples for you. But let's take a look at the conventional, traditional split first. And so I have some examples in the book, and these are different examples in the lecture in some cases. Some overlap, some don't. And so this... Uh, Part of the reason, by the way, I sometimes have to rely upon old examples is because for this kind of data, I use Yahoo Finance because the data is free. And uh, they changed their data displays about, uh, about a year ago, nine months ago or so, in, and they changed the way that they display their so-called adjusted close versus their close. And what that has done is really screw up the historical data for stock splits. It doesn't show up properly. So I can't easily go back and find the adjusted close versus the close and have that show the stock split as I did for this slide here, which is why all of the examples I'm currently using to demonstrate the splits are at least a couple of years old. This is a, one of those Cabot oil and gas on a two for one split. And so using from Finance Yahoo before they changed their algorithm, 
the adjusted data will always account for the split, and that's the red line. So the red line doesn't tell you what the market price would have been prior to the split. It tells you what the effect of the market price was, and the blue line records the actual price as stated on that day. And so you can see the day of the split where they went from a little under $80 a share to a little under $40 a share. And so that's kind of what a stock split looks like when you uh, see it in the data. Now, the more conspicuous example is the one that I still continue to use as a reference in the little textbook because, of course, you can relate to this. This is Apple and their seven-for-one stock split. Whereas it may not be the case that uh, if there's a company that's going to split its stock, that therefore the stock goes up. That's not the case for Apple, actually, of course. And so you can see I have marked when the split was announced on April the 23rd. And the stock clearly responded to that announcement after April the 23rd because you can see that pop up in the red line and the pop-up also in the green line, which was the actual stated market price of the stock before and after the split. But then you can see all of a sudden that for a while there, Apple was trading for 105 or so dollars per share in reference to the green line. And so that's, if you had 100 shares of Apple, then uh, you uh, we're happy to see that your 100 shares of Apple were trading for $105 per share. And then you wake up on the morning of uh, June the 2nd, or whenever it actually was, 1st or the 2nd, and then you see you now own 700 shares of Apple, but the price now is uh, considerably less. So that's nice. This means, of course, when we look at Apple today, and the current price, which is well off the high, by the way, of about $225 a share. That means split adjusted, therefore, that Apple is worth about um, seven times that, actually, in terms of how much you made on your investment if you bought it before 2014. Now, uh, here we look at the purpose for the reverse split. It's pretty easy to understand why a healthy company would want to split the price of their stock. As I say, if it's getting up to three or four hundred dollars a share, it might be less attractive to small investors because a hundred shares at three hundred dollars a share is thirty thousand dollars. That's a lot of money for small retail investors. So they argue, let's get this back down to about fifty dollars and keep the stock popular. But why would a company do the opposite? Why would they do their reverse stock split? Well, there's a single reason for that, and that's because in NASDAQ, if you're NASDAQ listed, if your stock drops below a dollar per share, they'll take it off the listing. And so as your stock falls in value and gets down there below two or three dollars a share, it's in your interest to not only reverse split your stock, but to do so in multiples to pull the price of the stock way back up above the listing cutoff line. And so if you think about the timing of this, because this is a big company, City, that we're talking about, the bank, City Group, or the parent company of the bank, they did a 1 for 10 reverse stock split on May the 9th, 2011. And you can see, well, before that, in 2007, the price of the per share was about $55 or so, and it plunged all the way down to close to one, and then it kind of uh, went sideways there for uh, more than a year, and finally they did this radical reverse split, and it pumped the price up to 45 or so, and then it came back down and then finally rallied. And so you say, what was the story there? Well, you remember, of course, that this bank was caught up in well, you don't remember that this bank was caught up, but you remember we were talking about a mortgage crisis, and so banks in general were hammered by that mortgage crisis, and Citi was an example of that. So in 2007, before that crisis hit, this was a healthy company with stock trading at 55, but Citi at least survived the crisis. Many banks did not. 
Uh, Lehman Brothers did not. Merrill Lynch, Brokerage House did not. A number of banks were destroyed by the crisis. Washington Mutual, one of the largest regional banks in the United States out here on the West Coast, were destroyed by the mortgage crisis. But Citi survived, but barely. And their stock got down there close to delisting, and so they had to have the one for 10. Now, you can see it, it kind of drifted back down, and then finally, um, fortunately for Citi, stabilized and the stock has since rallied up and the company's healthy. But if you say, well, if I had 100 shares going into this, did I only have 10 shares after? That's right, you only had 10 shares after. But your 100 share was only worth 100 bucks anyway because of what had happened to this company. Now, the most ridiculous example is the preposterous company Helios and Matheson Analytics, which was the company that owned the preposterous, bizarre, insane movie pass that some of you actually took advantage of. They, by the way, shut down their operations yesterday and they no longer exist. Now you may remember how movie pass worked. It was an exercise in absolutely pinnacle stupidity, right? <laughs> the way it worked was you paid $9.95 per month ultimately when it was at its worst, and you got this movie pass. And it enabled you to go to the movies as many times as you wanted to go to the movies. So if you wanted to go to the movies three times a day, you could go to the movies three times a day on movie pass. But you wouldn't want to do that. Maybe you only wanted to go to the movies three times a week at, say, AMC. All right? So that would be 12 times a month. $9.95, you could go see the movies 12 times with movie pass. So, of course, it met one of the criteria for doing well. They had a tremendous rise in clients <laughs> who were willing to buy. Some of you, how many of you had a movie pass pass? Any of you? Okay. <laughs> well, I wonder why so few. I would have thought that it, this was two or three years ago. I guess maybe you were too young for it. But uh, where did you get yours from? Um, one of my friends got his, um, and then he said, Did you use it? Uh, yeah, I used it. Like a, like a typical, how many times a month? Um, we, we had an early release, so we would go almost every day. Oh, <laughs> yeah, the original plan was not quite as generous until this firm took them over, Helios and Matheson, right? But this was kind of like the WeWork sort of thing. Let's just get a lot of attention and hope just the attention allows us to do a successful IPO, and then afterwards maybe we'll figure out how to make money. Because you say, well, how did it work? Uh, if, if you went to the movies 10 times and you paid $9.95 per month for that, how did it work? Well, this company went and bought the movie tickets at full face value and gave them to you. And they didn't even get a discount from the movie company, AMC. They paid full face value for the tickets. So every time you went to the movies, if the ticket was $11.95, then Helios and Matheson would buy the ticket for $11.95 and just give it to you and then you could go. So if you went 10 times, then they would have to pay $120 for tickets, that, and you got $9.95 <laughs> in revenue. So as you might guess, this was very hard on their cash flow. Uh, well, they did a, uh, so the, this story surfaced last year when their stock had plunged so much, they did a reverse stock split of one for 250. So uh, 250 shares got you one share, and uh, on July 24, 2018, if you owned 100 shares of HMNY, the next day you only owed four-tenths of one share because of the 1,250 stock split. And then on Friday, September the 7th, that stock would be worth uh, a little bit more than two cents times 0.04. Oh, no, not two cents, 0 0.00235 times 0 0.04. So that stock would be worth... Uh, less than a penny. And so in this case, the effort to keep the stock listed, I said, would likely fail. Well, of course, it was destined to fail, and it did fail. And uh, uh, they did another stock split not long ago. And of course, finally, they just ran out of cash, and they gave up. So uh, this is Helios and Matheson's uh, listing about that time. Uh, on the o OTC market, the over-the-counter market, as you can see, it's listed at 
0019 and, uh, and you would and then on top of that you had the insult of you only owed four tenth of one share because of the reverse stock split so as i say multiply 0 0.04 times that and that's what your investment was worth um, okay so you get a lot of that and it turns out right now that this is kind of a sign of the difficulties in the market for smalling smaller companies as i pointed out in the book i just recently looked at the mix of um, reverse and standard splits and the reverses are 20 to 1 uh, relative to the standard splits for every standard stock split there's 20 reverse splits going on at the current time and they're all for the same reason the stocks are going down towards a dollar and they threaten to be delisted now when they're delisted as i say they show up on the over-the-counter market in the so-called pink sheets that's where helios and matheson was and three days ago i looked at it was still there with uh, like 0. 0.00000 something you know and i don't know if it's still there or not now that they actually don't even exist anymore but i wouldn't be surprised if they are i wouldn't be surprised if it has volume bid ask people are trading it even though it doesn't exist uh short selling God, it seemed to me that I gave you a lecture on short selling. I didn't give you a lecture on short selling? Wow, what planet was I on when I gave that lecture on short selling? I haven't given you a lecture on short selling? No? Jeez. All right, good. Okay, I will now. I, somehow in my mind, I said, I told them all about short selling. Yeah, short selling is common. Um, that's what I mentioned a moment ago. Short, Do a short sale on SoftBank, right? Now, when you short sell a stock, you reverse the normal over the transaction. You sell the stock first, and you buy it back later. Oh, I know. One of you came into my office and asked me about what you read on this, and I think we had a conversation that lasted like an hour. That's why I think I gave the lecture. Um, so one of you had an advanced lecture on this. So you do this because you think of the, the, the uh, price of the stock will fall. Yeah. In short? Before stock split is what you owe also divided. I mean, it's just the math of it, right? If you whatever the math would turn out to be, if you're short uh, and it splits, then it, the split is affects it in the in the way that you would think, just logically and mathematically. Okay. What are you? Do you think you'll be in that position? <laughs> uh, so. You do this because you think the price of the stock will fall. Now, it shouldn't be surprising to you that I use the primary example because it is so heavily shorted of Tesla. Because Tesla is one of these companies where they're either going to make it or they're not going to make it. And this is kind of the time where this is going to be figured out. And it will be, depend almost entirely upon the level of sales of the Model 3. So, um, so Tesla is very heavily shorted at the present time. So technically, when you make this transaction, you borrow the stock in kind. So you say, I need to borrow 100 shares in this example of CBS. And when I pay you back later, I'll pay you back 100 shares of CBS. And you promise to pay the stock back. You borrow it indirectly from a party who's long in the stock for the long term, like a pension fund, and is willing to loan it to you using your collateral to earn a small return. Now, you do pay a rate of interest on the nominal value of the loan to your broker, and the broker splits that interest according to some prearrangement between the broker and the short source. In interactive brokers, it's exactly 50-50. So the payment you make for the short interest is collected by interactive brokers, and it's entirely, half of it stays with the interactive brokers, Half of it is passed on to the ultimate lender of the stock. And the rate you pay is highly variable and depends upon the degree to which it is a popular short. The more shorted it already is, the higher the rate of interest for the stock. Now here's what a short selling trading screen looks like. The one on the top is the TD Ameritrade snap ticket. And you can see under the action box, there's a box that literally says sell short. And so that's a recognition that you are selling the stock without owning it. And on the bottom, which is the TD Ameritrade, or excuse me, Interactive Brokers, my screen off my account, actually both of these are off my accounts. Uh, you can see where it says shortable. 
in that little green box. Now, what that means there for them, if you have permission to trade, then you could just do the short immediately. There's it's just like buying the stock. And uh, when you short it, you just click the sell button. You sell something you don't own. Now, let's use Tesla as our example, because Tesla, as I say, is a very shorted stock. Now, what's interesting, uh, I don't regard the new um, Porsche as a direct competitor with the Model 3. It's a different kind of car. But it is interesting in that it's getting a lot of attention. It's a really, really remarkable car. In the specs, the Model 3, well, maybe not the Model 3, actually not the Model 3, but the Grand X will accelerate from 0 to 60 or the eighth mile or the quarter mile slightly faster than this Porsche Taycan. Uh, it'll 0 to 60... Uh, the Model X speed or time is 2.6 seconds, whereas for the Taycan it's 2.8. The difference is, however, that the Porsche can turn it around and come back and do it 20 times. There's actually a YouTube video out there of a guy that accelerates the Porsche to full speed, full throttle, turns around and does it back and forth 20 times. The Tesla would catch fire if you did it. Well, it would. The, the battery's already super hot anyway when you do it just once. It would catch fire if you kept doing it, which is why the uh, ludicrous mode won't even let you do it twice, I don't think. If they will let you do it twice, they certainly won't let you do it a third time. But, you know, they're not in the same market. They're two different kind of cars. It's just showing off the technology in a different way. But it is interesting that now the electric car market's getting kind of cool and interesting for other reasons. So Tesla, now this is an older example of where a short would have paid off. And uh, this was where Tesla had an earnings report coming up on Wednesday, July the 24th, and this is the most recent July. Anticipating uh, earnings, the investor shorts Tesla on Monday, uh, July the 21st, and then say the bet is confirmed. And, uh, and then after the earnings, you have this clap. This is real data. This is what actually happened to Tesla after that earnings report. So there you see Tesla was 227.45 on Friday, the September the oh that's uh, sorry that's recent. So in the, our example there, that's around uh, July 24th is the top green bar, and then that was a Wednesday. So the next day, July the 25th, the Thursday, where it says buy here, that was Tesla's reaction to the fact that it was clear that their Model 3 sales were cannibalizing the sales from Model S and the Grand X, which was a problem people had not anticipated. So there was a poor reaction to it. Now let's continue to watch it. Uh, Tesla continues to sort of rise and fall. The last couple of days it's done well again. So when I typed this up last week, it's 227.45 on September the 6th. So let's keep an eye on it to see uh, how it does, but it still is very, very heavily shorted. Why would a company agree to like give you shares, loan you shares to short something when they need to make money if you end up like making the bet rate? You, you have to. I'm, I'm kind of hard of hearing, so you have to kind of yell at me. I just I misunderstand how like why a mutual fund would want to loan you out shares so that you can short them. And then buy them back at a lower oh, no, that's a good question. Why would anybody lend you the shares to short? Because most institutional investors, like your 401k, for example, and you invest in a 401k, you may invest in an index fund like SPY or the Vanguard S&P 500 index mutual fund. And so when you make that kind of investment, they allocate your investment across those 500 stocks and they buy them to never sell them because that fund is growing over its lifetime. So they know that they'll hold on to that inventory of stock basically forever. So uh, if they can make a fee on taking out of that inventory and lending it to you, you know, and they know they're going to get it back, then uh, they, that's extra income for them, right? And these days they might earn 4 or 5% annualized on that kind of sale, see? So they're never in the market to sell anyway, so they're always in the market to lend. It's actually quite lucrative for them if you think about it. Okay, so this is kind of the way it works with all the parties involved. They've got you, the seller, and then you've got some buyer. So you sell it to the buyer and you get cash for that. Now, the cash is not actually credited to your account. It's put there, but it's sort of like memoed, where you can't get access to it. It's there, but you can't pull it out or use it for anything. And you uh, have got a loan from 
say, interactive brokers or TD Ameritrade. And so the cash is earmarked as collateral for that loan, which is why you can't use it for anything. And then Interactive Brokers has uh, worked through its custodian bank in their securities lending program, which is an institution that arranges with these large investors to have the stock ready in the first place. And that custodian bank is working with a pension fund or a mutual fund company or whatever to ultimately be the source of lending. So all these different parties are involved. And nonetheless, for you, it's a snap, instant electronic payment that on which there's no latency. And if you want to put in a limit order to sell short Tesla, the speed of execution is typically, literally, in microseconds. So uh, in terms of when they get the order and when it comes back is confirmed to you. It may delay between that confirmation and what you see in your screen, but you own that stock or have short of that stock, I should say, uh, literally within microseconds. So it works very well. Now, it's kind of interesting to look at short data, and there's a lot of free short data out there, because if you're a trader, knowing what's short is obviously pretty important to know. And so the data source I usually go to is NASDAQ uh, short sales, which you can find on Google just by typing in NASDAQ short sales. And this sort of thing pops up. And you can see by the tabs, that you can sort of keep a tab of these various stocks you may be looking at. So here we're looking at Tesla and Apple and Facebook and FFIN is uh, First Financial Bank shares, which is a stock that has almost all of their shares shorted at the current time because people think it's going to go bankrupt. So the data that you therefore look at, which I, by the way, require you to know, these two categories or so, it's in the book and it's red linked in the book, so you know it's important. Short interest is the total number of shares sold short. So if it's for Tesla, 39 million shares sold short means that's the short interest. And the days to cover, which is far more important, is the short interest divided by the average daily volume for the last three months. Now, the reason that matters, of course, is because you say, well, being shorted is bearish. There are so many people that think this stock is a dog, they've shorted it. But those shorts have to cover. And so therefore, this means there's a huge amount of latent demand for the stock there because they have to cover those shorts. So therefore, these kinds of stocks are volatile potentially in the short run. Everybody shorts it, then maybe it goes up. And they say, oh my God, we're losing money. So then they have to cover. That drives it up even more right? Or it goes down because, as predicted, some bad news, but then everybody has to cover, and that puts a floor on it, right? So knowing what short interest is, which is the level of shorts compared to the typical trading volume, is, is a critical piece of information. So you can see, uh, and then shorts as a percent of total outstanding, those three things. So if you take a look at Tesla and what they have here for NASDAQ are days to cover and the like. And so we're looking at Tesla and you can see, wow, it's kind of variable, isn't it? Days to cover, six, four, three. That's very high, by the way. For a company like uh, Apple or so, the days to cover would be less than one. So when you see a big stock that's six or seven, it's heavily shorted. But it's nothing anywhere close to the record because if on any given day you see the record, it'll be 50%. You know, 50% of the shares will be um, shorted on a stock that is really held in low regard. And probably the most shorted stock right now of stocks that you would recognize would be uh, GameStop. They're on the brink of bankruptcy and they're almost 100% shorted out right now because they can't survive the internet competition. I saw a question here. Yeah. Uh, so if it does go bankrupt um, and you have shorted it and then it goes bankrupt, what? What you do is you head to the nearest uh, bar and you buy Manhattans for everybody. <laughs> and you use um, Canadian Royal Rye, which is expensive because your dream has come true. <laughs> Yeah, you, you buy it. 
on the over-the-counter market and pay it back happily, right? For like the movie pass, <laughs> buy a trillion shares of movie pass. <laughs> Okay, now we need to talk about order routing and then the all-important question about how your order gets routed. This is important material. Again, it has a heavier weight on the exam than some of the other stuff. You can kind of tell what matters. So you're going to be making what is called a limit order or a market order. That's going to go to your broker like Interactive Brokers, Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade. Then normally they will send that to an exchange like New York Stock Exchange, ARCA. And then the trade is actually made, there's all this paperwork that has to be taken care of by a quotation service that is providing the quotation and a clearinghouse that makes sure that all the transactions are cleared off and all of that. There's also, however, an alternative route for the order where it may go to an order flow market maker like uh, GSCO, which is Goldman Sachs. It may be routed not to an exchange, but to a private company, and that's where this gets complicated. Now, if you trade with Robinhood, and I know that's popular with Harvey Mutters, Robinhood sells all of their order routing, so their stuff never goes to an exchange. Their order, if you submit an order to Robinhood, it goes to someone who's buying that order flow from Robinhood. If, on the other hand, I send it to interactive brokers, I either tell it to send a smart route, which goes simply to the best PBBO price, or I specify that I want it to go to a specific exchange if I have some reason for doing that, which is seldom, but sometimes the case. Now, let's talk about the parties involved here. Some of this you know, I'm sure, most of you, because everybody knows a little bit about this stuff. But here on our brokers, we have our discount and online brokers. I have one listed here that doesn't exist anymore. E-Trade, American Tra Ameritrade, Scott Trade, and Trade King. Both Scott Trade and Trade King are gone now. Interactive Brokers and Robinhood maybe should replace those. I don't recommend Robinhood, by the way, <laughs> and never, never would. Uh, then you have your traditional full-service brokers that your parents, if they're wealthy, might use. Uh, in some cases, they don't charge to trade stocks. They just hold or charge a certain percentage of your assets, like 1% per year or some arrangement like that, because they're providing a lot of detailed financial service to your parents that they're implicitly paying for. And these are useful for really large accounts or for clueless investors. Uh, and uh, the track record was very bad in the 2000 crash, by the way, of these highly paid advisors. They did not give very good advice in 1999. Then, of course, we have the specialized online that will trade only specific types of trade, like uh, Tasty Trade for options only, or Forex traders for Forex only, or futures trading only. And then we have small market traditional ripoff brokers um, for people who don't know what they're doing, that overcharge for too much and the like. So, of course, for the largest part here, we talk only about the discount and online brokers because they are very inexpensive and their services are perfectly adequate for people like you and me. Now, here's a kind of informal assignment. I would like you to peruse TD Ameritrade and interactive brokers. Just go to their websites and click around. These, of course, are these worthless WordPress websites that emphasize pretty pictures and uh, very little content but at least you can look at a lot of pretty pictures of things, but you can see trading screens and the like. Maybe look at E-Trade, maybe look at Robinhood and see how this is all set up. But see if you can spot their fees for trading to get a sense of how they differ, because they differ a great deal, and uh, what their trading platforms look like in terms of the physicality of the trading platforms and how they're designed. Um, and what they require to open an account. Now, the reason Robinhood is so attractive is because you can put the smallest amount of money you can send and open an account with them, whereas to open effectively an account at Interactive Brokers, you require $25,000. So, you know, that's why students don't use Interactive Brokers. And Robinhood doesn't charge transactions fees for making the trades. It's free. You send a buy or sell, then it's free. And you can do it off your smartphone if you're completely crazy and want to trade having no information about the stock other than the whatever's on your smartphone at the time. Why don't you like Robinhood then? What? Why don't you 
Why don't you like Robin Hood? Well, Robin Hood is not likely to do a good job for you. It is basically one of you get what you pay for kinds of things. First of all, if your orders are routed and you're paying for options, which is what I do, you're not getting the prices I'm getting. You're not getting the action I'm getting. You're not getting the low latency that I'm getting. You're getting whatever they decide to provide to you for nothing. So um, if you want to buy 100 shares of GM because of the strike or you want to short it, and then a week from now you're going to sell it, no problem on Robinhood. You know, give them a limit order. They'll execute it, probably get a reasonably good price, and a week from now you won't trade it. If you start trading, though, the more you start trading, the more you're likely to be cut here. You miss that. Trading is very complicated, and um, getting what the markets assure you is the best market price, the NBBO price, it doesn't actually work as smoothly as people think it does. Uh, it works really well given the complexity of how it's supposed to work, but it doesn't work perfectly well, and that little lack of perfection could ultimately cost you. So. Um, Robinhood also, I think, will likely at some point go broke because they don't have enough revenue. And what are you going to do when that happens? So, but I don't want to talk about Robinhood. I'm just saying, don't use Robinhood. Uh, and go go look on Reddit and see why other people say don't use Robinhood. So, yeah. I have a question about like the like TD Ameritrade trade options. Like, is there a particular reason why you would want to open multiple accounts over multiple brokerages? Which brokerage? Like, or. Like TD Ameritrade or Charles Schwab, is there a reason why you would want to like have multiple? You have to shop for what you're looking for with these brokerages. Now, the reason that I and most other professionals use interactive brokers is because their fees for large trades are practically zero. We have to pay for our data, though. Our data feeds cost us, in my case, about $120 a month. So uh, TD Ameritrade will give you level one and level two data for free, but they'll charge you $12 a trade. Um, I pay $120 a month for level one, level two to all the uh, brokerages, but my trade 10 times larger than the use will cost me 80 cents. So that's the trade off. So when you start out young, you start off with TD Ameritrade and you switch over to a um, low fee broker as your account grows. Okay, now this is what it looks like. It's really easy to buy and sell stock. You can see uh, TD Ameritrade screen showing best bid and best ask for Intel. And you can say, oh, all I have to do is fill this stuff out, click that review order. It gives me information I look at. If I like it, click that, and the order goes in. It's as simple as that. But this requires us to understand what they're calling best bid and best ask. So this gets a little complicated. And it's also sometimes very misrepresented in popular literature, especially the level two part of it is represented. So we'll be careful to understand really how it works. Now, stepping back, you say, uh, I posted, by the way, a video of what these level two screens look like. It's not really assigned yet, but if you've jumped ahead and looked at that video, you saw how rapidly this stuff flows in to the order flow and the like on a big stock like uh, Intel or something like that. The orders just come flying in a few million shares per second in some cases. So we're not talking about a quiet, dormant market. We're talking about a national and global structure that queues up orders that are just absolutely flying at the speed of light. And so... People are bidding and asking, but they're doing so on a very heavy scale. Well, best bid, and this is kind of, by the way, tautological. I have to explain something using jargon that's not quite understood. Then I have to explain that jargon. Then I come back and explain it again. And by the time I've gone through the definition a couple of times, everybody should understand it. Because in this, I say, of the limit order submitted, and you say, well, what's a limit order, <laughs> right? And I say, well, a limit order is when you look at best bid and then submit an order. Well, what's best bid? This is the chicken before the chicken before the horse. No, that's not right. Is it the yeah. horse before the cart, chicken before the something? Yeah. <laughs> chicken before the egg, that's right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Best bid is of the limit order submitted to buy stock. Of the orders submitted by people to buy the stock, this is supposed to be the highest. And I supposed to be means, in other words, there's a little friction in this where it usually is, but not necessarily. This is relevant to you if you're trying to sell the stock with the market order. 
best ask is of the limit order submitted to sell stock, this is supposed to be the lowest. This is relevant to you if you're trying to buy the stock with the market order. Now, you say, I don't understand what a market order or a limit order is. Well, again, we'll look at all these things, then come back and look at this definition, and it'll all make sense. So let's try to do that, okay? We have this system that used to be called NBBO, now called PBBO, which is a protocol, an electronic protocol that is arranged by technology. So your orders, whether a market order or a limit order, is routed by many brokers through many market makers and other major transactions to any one of the three primary exchanges in the United States. So these order, orders can come from anywhere and go just about anywhere, and they're just flying all day long to where, of course, billions of shares are trading. So how does a single level 2 queue, or more important, how does a single best bid and best ask emerge from this chaos? Now again, the best bid and best ask is going to be the best price you can get at the moment for that stock. So let's think of it like that. In 1978, there's a lot of acronyms, I admit, this uh, corporation, SIAC, executed a protocol, designed a protocol that's still in place called the uh, CQS and CQP, Consolidated Quotation System. And this structure identifies the best bid and offer, highest bid, lowest ask, which is then disseminated by another organization to market participants through this line called the multicast line. So in other words, it's a lot of jargon about the institutions that consolidate these orders and then arrange, and these are orders, by the way, that are literally nanoseconds apart from each other and are time stamped at that level to put them in a queue and send them all out to this dynamic structure where they're ranked according to the price that's associated with them. So the protected PBBO quote is what you see on a website like TD Ameritrade as bid or ask. That is called a level one quote. So back here, looking at this uh, TD Ameritrade up there at the top where you see INTC bid 45.49, ask 45.50. Those are what I'm referring to. And those are the result of this complicated process. Their life is measured in microseconds. Then they're replaced. Now they may be replaced with the same price, but it's actually a different order that's replacing it in many cases, okay? So let's now kind of settle down and say, okay, what are the difference between all these things? If you submit a market order, that's an order for the broker to buy a stock at the best possible price. That's the nature of your order. It's like you say, buy Intel, please, 100 shares at the best possible price. Thank you, hang up the phone. Or thank you, click it off. The limit order, which is the way I'm going to tell you to order, is an order to buy a stock only if the price falls below some, spe to or below some specified price. That's the difference. So you say, well, buy FireEye, but only at $14.32 or below, as opposed to buy FireEye at the best possible price. So the first order is a market order buy FireEye at the best possible price. The second order is a limit order, buy FireEye at the price of fourteen thirty-two dollars or below. And that's the distinction between those two. That's a distinction you have to have in your sleep. And by the way, it's not just stocks. This kind of structure exists for all financial securities. The bid, ask, limit order, market order is the same for bonds, stocks, futures contracts, um, foreign exchange, and so forth. A couple of related orders. A stop loss order is for a stock already owned. You sell at the market if the price falls below a price you specify. So you say if the price hits 1408, sell it as a market order. And a stop limit order is a combination of those two. Place a limit order at X if the stock falls below X or falls below Y. 
So you can say sell my FireEye at 1408 or better if FireEye falls below 1410. That's a stop loss order or something, right? So when you go back to the trading screen, you see all these different options on the trading screen. And on the top one here, we have a limit order. And on the bottom, we have a market order. Now, by the way, again, I'm going to emphasize to you, you will always use limit orders. Uh, so you enter this. So you're looking at this and you're saying, this is dynamic, by the way. It changes very fast. On Intel, you see the bid is 45.48. The ask is 45.49. You say, wasn't it just 49 and 50? Yeah, this is a few seconds later. Okay. So you say, let's put a limit order to, uh, what are we doing? We're buying 100 shares of Intel. So you can see it going across the screen. Action, buy, quantity 100, stock Intel, order type limit at 40, what was it, 45, 30 it looks like. Huh? I can't see my own screen. 45, 30, I guess, is what I'm looking at here. My screen is too small for me to see it easily. And you say, that's an order to buy Intel at a price of 45.30 or better. Now you say, well, but the price of Intel, the bid and the ask is 45.48, 45.49. This is a better price than that. Is this going to execute? No. Not unless that bid and ask goes down to this level that you've just entered because you've entered a limit order to buy below the market at 45.30 in this case. Now, if uh, you choose a market order, which is on the bottom slide, the price box disappears because you're not allowed to specify a price for a market order. That means buy at the best price. The best price is going to be what if you're buying? It's going to be best, um, best ask. So that's effectively an order to buy at the best price you could get. By definition, that is best ask. So that's effectively an order to buy at 45.50 in this case. Again, these are seconds apart, yet the price is changing all the time. So this market order is in order to buy at ask 45.50. Now, the reason I stress that is by the time you hit that button and the order goes in, it might be 45.30 or 45.80. It's whatever it happens to be when your order hits the queue. And there are literally, perhaps, 100,000 orders in front of yours, even though I'm talking about a period of time of less than one full second, right? Which is why you use limit orders. So you say, oh, I'm beginning to see how this works now. Well, let's look at level two quotations, and then it really becomes clear on how this works. So this is kind of a made up, simplified example. What happens to your limit order when you submit it? In the previous example, we said, I want to submit a limit order to buy 100 shares of Intel at 45.30. That is below the market. That order is not going to immediately execute because it's too low. So it goes, therefore, into the limit order queue somewhere. It's, we got an order here to buy at 45.30. They organize those orders into prices that are either falling in value or rising in value. On the bid side, they're falling in value. So the highest price nationally that has been bid with a limit order is on the top. And on the ask side, they are uh, rising in value. So the lowest order nationally that has been bid is on the top. And that's best bid on the top on the bid side by definition. And that's best ask on the top by definition also on the ask side. How did it get there? Because again, the bid is the lowest of all the bids. And you say, well, wouldn't that be any number of orders at that price? Absolutely. There may be, you can see in this example, there's 400 shares represented there, right? The four. That may be one order by one of you to uh, offer to buy, a limit order to buy at 46.44 for 400 shares. Or it could be four separate parties each bidding the same um, at 100 shares each. The one below it is 32 shares coming from NASDAQ, 46.43. That's probably not a single purchase limit order. There's probably five or six of them. 
two uh, at uh, 46, 43, eight more, three more, four more until it adds up to 32, right? So the limit order to buy is placed in the bid queue in its appropriate slot, and the limit order to sell is placed in the ask queue in its appropriate slot, with on the bid side, which again are orders to buy, the best being on top, and that's where best bid comes from. It's the top of the level two structure, and the market order and, and the best uh, ask is on the other side. Again, on the bottom in this case. A market order to buy will be executed at the best ask. Market order to buy. That's how they work against each other, right? So you submit a limit order, it goes where it belongs in the bid or the ask queue, depending upon whether it's a bid, which is an offer to buy, or an ask, which is an offer to sell. It just goes where it belongs. If you submit a market order, then it is executed instantly off the top of the bid or ask queue, depending upon whether it's an order to buy or sell. A market order to buy is, remember, an order to buy the stock at the best possible price you can get. The best possible price you could get is $46.47. It's the lowest of all of those listed. So it's executed at that. It's a pretty cool system. It works extremely well. And again, though, it's very, very fluid. This is why I have a video posted where I show you what a heavily traded tracking stock ETF is doing moment by moment, where I say, just take a look at the best bid part of the quotation queue, and you'll see it's just flying along, going up and down, flying along. Orders by the thousands appearing and disappearing within just a few seconds. So this, of course, is very dynamic. But it's just a computerized queuing system that's putting it where it belongs, and then when an order is transacted, it's adjusting everything at the speed of light, literally, okay? So now the level two, um, those, there's a slight complication. When you look at a level two quotation, it shows the best bid and the best ask at each exchange or offered by each major market participant. So you're looking at this and see MPID is a market participant ID. You say that's not repeated. There's one BATS, there's one NASDAQ, there's one RX, there's one Cincinnati, there's one Goldman Sachs. And on the other side, there's one of each and so forth. And you say, why isn't there two NASDAQ? It's because the best order from NASDAQ on the bid side is 4643, and the other NASDAQ orders are not listed. That's how level two works. It's a simple little display that shows the best bid and best ask from each exchange and major market participant. This, of course, is made up. This is what a real one looks like. This is level two, Intel showing best bid and best ask for Intel. Okay, but these are limit orders. The one that matters the most, though, in terms of, I need to see all the orders, that is a deep book limit order where all the limit orders are queued up. And this is what you pay a fortune for. This is what you can't get because it costs about 80 bucks a month. So I have to pay that for this. Is why you don't ever see examples of this. So this is the deep book limit order book for each of the exchanges. So when we look at this, you'll say every single limit order that exists is in this thing. Now, I only have one of the buttons clicked, and that's NASDAQ total view. So we're only looking at NASDAQ total view. If I had all the buttons clicked, then I would have the, all of the exchanges listed, right? The trouble is that they would all be 47, whatever the top is, because uh, you can see how deep these numbers go. Now, this is the one that shows all of the limit orders. So you put in a limit order, it's not going to be executed immediately because of the nature of what a limit order is, but it goes into its proper little slot on the exchange to which it was submitted by your broker. If it goes to NASDAQ, it ends up on this book, NASDAQ Total View. If it goes to New York Stock Exchange, that's NYSE ARCA or their open book, it ends up being there. The best bid and best ask is at the top of whichever this queue is actually the, the uh, smallest bid and the highest ask, right? 
So again, the market orders pick off the top of the queue, the limit orders go into the queue, and all day long they go up and down like this, all day long. You say, well, isn't it the case then that ask always has to be higher than bid? Always? Yep. It's not logically possible for otherwise. They can't be the same, of course, because that means that there's a limit order out there to buy and sell at the same price, so of course those are executed, not listed, right? They have to be at least ask above bid by a penny. Now, on really, really liquid stocks, the spread is a penny. Always, it's a penny. Best ask is always a penny above best bid. And you'll notice on all those Intel examples, that was the case. But when we looked at our example from the book called Nathan's Famous, which is an illiquid stock, not heavily traded, the bid ask spread was more than a dollar. The less liquid a stock is, the wider the spread between bid and ask. This means, of course, that if you're trading small cap stocks, you're crazy not to use limit orders. If the spread between the buy and sell price is more than a dollar, you'd be out of your mind not to use a limit order, right? That meant, that means that if you buy it right now on a market order and sell it a second later in a market order, you lose a buck because of the spread between bid and ask. There's a third type uh, appearing quotation, and this is also a deep book viewer, which ranks them all on the same line, with asks going down and bids going up. A lot of uh, really, really active traders use this because it's easy to make trades directly off of this by just clicking on it and the trade is made. You can see at the top of these, they'll say something like, is this armed? See where that says armed? You can't see my, uh, up there in the, uh, you see the red arrow, then you look up to the left, to the right. Let's see, right or left? Right. Right of that, uh, it says armed. If that is checked off, I click on one of these, it buys it, or submits a limit order. All right, so, uh, so if you're doing really fast, old-fashioned trading, then you arm this stuff, you click on it, you're making the trade. So you can sit here all day long and buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, if you're a day trader, right? Now, I would never do that. You let computers do that kind of thing. So the real distinction you need to understand, and you may have to think about this and go back and look at the example in the book, is the distinction between level two and the true deep limit order book. The latter has all of the limit orders, and the level two has the best from each exchange, and best bid, best ask is, of course, off the top of the level two. If you're using a market order, that's the price you get off the top of the level two. If you use a limit order, it goes where it belongs in the queue, and you wait for the market to move it to your price. If it doesn't, it never gets purchased. As we point out, you give a limit order a duration. The typical duration is GTC, which is hold it there for the rest of the day and then cancel it. But also there's G2W, hold it there for a week. Or G, excuse me, not GTC. GTD, good through the day, sorry. GTC is good till cancel. Leave it there until it's canceled. So... I think if you go back and think about this, but also look at the little video that I posted that shows what this looks like dynamically, you know, in real time, it makes, it'll make sense to you. You do need to understand the distinction. You do need to know where your order would go if you place it, if it's a market order. You need to know where your order would go if you place it, if it's a limit order. This is, I'm not going to hold you accountable for this type of trader. These are too hard to read. I'm just showing to you that what I, what I want you to understand is this one and that one. Those two, okay? This one here I've got because they exist. I actually trade off of them, but it's, uh, it's a special version of the same thing. Uh, here we have Clovis Oncology, which is one of the biotechs we can trade from time to time. And you look at this and you say, well, what's Best Buy? And you say, oh, that's got to be the red one, right? Yep. What's Best Gas? That's got to be the green one. What's the last trade? That's the blue one. So, of course, um, traders, you know, are used to reading these. And so you, 
you you sort of look at the histogram on the on the side there, which is like a the the depth of the orders and stuff, and sometimes you trade off of that. I don't do that kind of trading, but others do. Let me try to complete this. Um, I can complete it too, so I will. So a market order to buy, and I'll just say buy, you can see where the sell was reversed. A market order to buy will normally result in the immediate purchase of your stock at best ask. In an orderly market for a liquid stock, where there's only a penny spread, that's suitable. In a market for a less liquid stock, where there's often a wider spread, a limit order should be placed between the two, or at least no higher than the best ask when buying, or no lower than best bid when selling. And that's going to be more suitable than a market order. In a high volume volatile market, when the bid ask queue is racing, and I will be able to capture one of those before the semester is over and post it up, we'll have an active day at some point where the Dow is moving five or 600 points. And you'll see why on a, such a day as that, you never want to trade without using a limit order. You can't even see the prices change. They change so fast. Uh, you must use a limit order or you might end up getting a price you really don't want. When trading first day IPOs, options, futures, and other derivatives, you must use limit orders and you have to get very good at doing that. One of the reasons that I advise those of you who actually intend to trade stocks to use limit orders is you need to use them when they're important, so you should use them all the time to get used to using them. They should be very familiar to you, so never use a market order if you're going to be trading. Uh, if trading practice using limit orders even in stable markets, when market orders will suffice. Now here's one of the reasons. This is Nathan's Famous, a stock I've always used as an example of a less popular, less liquid stock. Now this is the full limit order book we're looking at here. All of them are um, checked. And so you've got your best bid at 66.23, and you say, oh, the other one's only five cents more. No, that's 67.28. It's a dollar and five cents more. There's a dollar five spread between best bid and best ask. If you look at Apple, Intel, Microsoft, these big companies, it's always a penny spread. You look at these small caps, it's often 50 cents, 75 cents, a dollar or more. So uh, Nathan had a, is a relatively illiquid stock. Their average daily volume was 7.5 thousand shares, 7,000 shares, when Intel's average daily volume is 21 million. And of course, Apple is 10 times bigger than Intel in terms of daily volume. SPY is five times bigger than Apple in terms of daily volume, right? So when you have this relatively small volume, you have bid 66.23 and ask 67.28. So this is one of the effects of lack of liquidity or relative trading volume. So of course you use a limit order here to buy or sell. And you have to use a limit order, whether buying or selling, probably somewhere in between the two if you expect it to trade. So I'm going to end, let me finish, and then if we have time, I'll get to a question, okay? I want to make sure I get through this. Here's your first bit of trading advice, and here we're looking at Tesla, which was shortable, right? Use limit orders, never market orders. Now here we're looking at 278.06, 278.21, right? So that's not a penny spread. Tesla's so volatile that often the spread there is 50 cents. So... What are you going to do? You're not going to use a market order ever for a stock like Tesla. It's too volatile. Submit a limit order to buy at best bid, 278.21, and that will give you an automatic purchase, typically at that price, if you move quickly. It you know, may jump around where it doesn't, but that's almost always going to give you the purchase. So a limit order to buy at best bid is going to execute right away. But you could also submit a limit order between bid and ask at like 278.10, which is a better price, obviously. But you may not get it, right? It's got to go to the market before you get it. It becomes, uh, if, it, if you submit a limit order for uh, 278.10, do you understand that it then becomes best bid? Your order becomes best bid, right? It would. It would go to the top of the queue, and that would be your order. It would be best bid. Right? So if um, somebody submits a market order to um, sell, it'll execute for you at that price because you're best bid. 
You can also, though, put a limit order in at 277.05 and get a better price than the current market. That'll happen, of course, only if in the volatility of the day, it dips down into that range. If it does, though, you'll execute at 277.05. So obviously part of the finesse in using limit orders is to figure out where you want to put your order. Now, sometimes the sheer volatility of the day tells you you're crazy to put it even between best bid and best ask. If the stock's going like this all day long, and the spread is like this all day long, the spread's doing this, well, why not put it here when it's up here? So if it does come back down one more time, you'll get it for 3 or $4 less than would have been the case had you tried to put the order inside the bid-ask queue. But there's no guarantee of that, right? If it's down here and it's going like this and it shoots off, your order never executes, and you don't get the stock you want, and that's one of the trade-offs you have to have. So the finesse on buying and selling, even if you're a buy and hold, is handling limit orders properly, never market orders. So you say, I'm going to do, you need to know, do I do between bid ask or at best bid or best ask, or I want to go a little below if I'm buying, a little above if I'm selling? What does my knowledge of the market tell me about what the possibilities are? On options trading, you know, on this sort of thing, you buy Tesla, you don't get quite it right, it costs you a couple bucks. On options trading, which we'll talk about much later in this course, the difference between being profitable and not being profitable is almost entirely determined by how you make your limit order trades. It's such a finesse market. You have to be nearly perfect at executing limit orders to make money in trading options. Very competitive market. This stuff, you could be sloppy and, you know, cost you a couple hundred bucks, right? But in options trading, not. So... Make sure you understand the distinction between the limit order, the market order, the level two, and the full deep book queue, and sort of the strategy of how you might place an order with a limit order, and you'll be in good shape for a big chunk of the first exam. Okay? All right, we'll see you um, in two days. Sorry I didn't get your question. Go back to the Nathan's famous example. The Nathan's famous sausage. Yeah. It said that the ad like a... What's the... Yeah, this one? What's that? You from just buying the 6728 and immediately... I guess... It's not liquid. Oh, so you could just put it immediately... This could sit for an hour without not a single trade being placed. No, we trade this in Econ 136 to spread arbitrage is where you buy, you submit a order to buy at a penny above and an order to sell at a penny below, and you become best bid and best ask. That's what market makers do. But and you do that and it sits there all day, <laughs> or, or somebody jumps inside of you, right? And so if it's, if it's liquid, there's only a penny spread, you can't do it. If it's not liquid, it won't trade. <laughs> so there's no magical... Spread is so large. What would I say the value of Nathan's Famous right now? It's arbitrary. It's what you think it is. Yeah. It's certainly not last. So I mean, like when like you a lot of people say the answer is last. That is not the answer. It's got to be between bid and ask. Oh, so the correct answer would be between. Well, I normally say if it's a model, you use the peg, and the peg is the midpoint. In, a, in an algo model, they use a peg usually. Okay, so all the displays on Yahoo. Oh, that's all junk. That's all crap. Yeah, all of it's crap. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You pay for it. I mean, the the data they have, open, high, low, close, which is actual PBBO data, that's good. The historical data, open, high, low, close, everything else is crap. The quotes are total crap. They're completely worthless. Wait, so historical closes? That's the historical data. Open, high, low, close, the candlestick data you can get, that's good data. That's the only good data on Yahoo. Everything else is junk. Even the stuff on Robinhood is junk, let alone Yahoo.